Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Monday edition of Bizapalooza Chat. I'm your host, Stephen Taylor, publisher of DIY Marketers. I am a brain freak. I don't know if that's a hashtag, hashtag brain freak. I am so fascinated by the way brains work and how our brains work on marketing, what influences us and what doesn't influence us. And there's a science to that, and it's called neuromarketing. If you're one of the folks that don't know what that is, don't worry, because I have got the pro. I am such a huge fan of Roger Dooley. He's the publisher of Neuromarketing Blog. He's written tons and tons of books. I'm not going to say much more. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Welcome, Roger. Well, thanks for inviting me here, Yvonne. And it's uh, fun to reach a new audience with a little bit of the gospel of neuromarketing. I am so excited, but you know, as folks are, you know, jumping into the chat, you know, we've got a whole little introduction thing going on there. So while they jump in and get settled, why don't you and I do a quick roundup of what is neuromarketing? How did you get interested in it? How does it work? Well, uh, first of all, I like a broad definition of neuromarketing, Ivana. Uh, some people want to restrict it to the sort of hard tools of neuroscience like fMRI or EEG for measuring brain waves. But uh, to me, uh, neuromarketing is uh, really any use of brain science or behavior science to understand uh, uh, and in, understand your customers and improve your marketing. Hmm. So in addition to those tools, I'll use not quite so neuro tools like biometrics or implicit testing, and also the many, many tools of behavior science that come to us from folks like uh, Robert Cialdini, Dan Ariely, and so on. Oh, I'm such a fan of both of those guys, right? I, actually, just the other day, one of our chats for Thursday, we were talking about reciprocity, and that's like a little brain trigger. It's like we're wired for certain things. But before I digress, let's talk a little bit about the history of neuromarketing. How old is it? Uh, it um, really... Uh, I guess I've been involved in this space for about uh, 11 or 12 years now. And uh, yes, 12, and I was thinking about it uh, 13 years ago, and there were people who were thinking about it before me. Uh, the, uh, but in those days, it was really in its infancy. There were a few people who were, uh, had very small businesses that were trying to, uh, say, uh, use fMRI to measure customers, uh, consumers' brain activity while they were watching ads. Uh, the uh, studies were very small. The uh, interpretation of the data, to a large degree, was guesswork at that point. Uh, people were trying to learn as they went and figure out, uh, you know, there, there's no perfect map of the brain. It's not like the phrenologists where they have the skull all mapped out with a little area for everything. Uh, in fact, uh, human brains are really complex. Uh, uh, everybody's brain is a little bit different. Uh, and in any given moment, when people are uh, consuming content, when they're making a decision, lots of areas of the brain are activated to varying degrees. So uh, figuring out uh, when different areas of somebody's brain lights up, when they're looking at an advertisement, uh, uh, is uh, initially was, was really quite difficult. Now, over the years, uh, our understanding of the data has improved, and I think the prediction process is getting a little bit more accurate. Uh, you're getting some major university work done. Uh, Temple University did uh, a big study a couple of years ago, and they identified one uh, area of the brain that uh, seemed to uh, correlate with intent to buy. So it's, it's um, uh, improving, but there's still uh, a lot that we have to learn. Uh, the Neuromarketing topic has not been a popular one in universities uh, until quite recently. Before, it was kind of like talking about flying saucers or ESP. Really? Now, that I had no idea about because one of the things that occurred to me as I was sort of digging around to, you know, as we were doing some research to come up with our questions, one of the things that I thought was really intriguing is how sensory neuromarketing is. And I'll talk about this a little bit later in the chat, but you know, to me, and actually the intro question is, what's your favorite smell and why? Because I think when it comes to neuromarketing, our senses are so powerful. And isn't that like the oldest marketing in the book? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that it's important to understand that uh, in some cases, uh, neuromarketing is simply helping us understand techniques that have been around for a long time because 
uh, you know, long before people were talking about it, uh, you could go into a supermarket and walk by their bakery and you get the great smell of baked bread uh, uh, that was deliberately wafted into there to make uh, you hungry. And I'm sure that technique probably goes back to the uh, marketplaces in Greek and Roman days and maybe even much earlier when people would uh, uh, be grilling uh, meat where folks could smell it and be induced to buy. So, uh, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, not all of the science is new, but what it's doing is helping us understand different things. And we're uh, uh, actually using uh, sometimes not even uh, sophisticated neuromarketing techniques to understand how those things work in unexpected ways. For example, there was a study a few years ago uh, in, conducted in a bookstore where they introduced uh, scent into the air. And what they found was that a chocolate scent caused people to spend more time browsing in books in the store and actually increased their purchases. So uh, in, in this case, uh, it's totally unrelated. You know, obviously, if you smell a, a, gr a grilling rotisserie chicken in your supermarket, that's going to get saying, oh boy, how about chicken for dinner? But uh, you would not expect that uh, chocolate scent would make you buy more books. And so uh, some of those findings are pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I talked about as I was, you know, promoting this to folks is that, you know, neuromarketing isn't, we, we come to, to relate neuromarketing with this fMRI research and it's all sounds, you know, very, very difficult and expensive and so on and so forth. Now, do, have you had any experience with how small businesses can use neuromarketing or is, are there any like little hacks and tests that they can do, you know, to, to practice it on their own? Sure. And in fact, when I started writing about neuromarketing a dozen years ago, I was really focused on sort of the expensive, costly tools like uh, you would use to, say, evaluate a Super Bowl ad. Uh, and uh, the problem I sort of, uh, as I wrote about that stuff, uh, I found it uh, uh, disappointing that only a few companies out there could really employ those techniques uh, because they're very expensive. Uh, and uh, the uh, so I started focusing on things that uh, businesses of any size could do. Now, uh, as far as the actual sort of tools of neuromarketing, uh, uh, the good news is those are actually coming down in cost. Not to the point where every small business can use them yet, but I think uh, that should be on uh, their radar in the coming years because, uh, for instance, there's a technique called facial coding that uh, in which uh, trained observers would look for very quick micro expressions on people's faces to determine how they really felt. So while they were watching an ad or hearing a product described, uh, they could tell not what the people were saying that, oh, that sounds good, but really what they felt, which maybe uh, deep down they didn't think it was such a good idea. Uh, and uh, that used to be a very expensive proposition that involves uh, videoing uh, the subjects uh, viewing in slow motion uh, by expert uh, uh, people who've been trained in this uh, technique. Uh, now, uh, this can be done uh, via automation, uh, in some cases using webcams or even mobile device cams. So uh, when you do that, the cost comes way down, and of course the scalability goes up, because another thing that's plagued neuromarketing has been the small sample sizes. You know, typically, in the U.S. at least, uh, a study using fMRI might have 10 subjects or 15 subjects or 20 subjects, which uh, from a consumer marketing standpoint uh, is pitifully small compared to most of the techniques used. But once you start pushing these things out on mobile devices, uh, then uh, your scalability goes way up. But uh, to me, the uh, more interesting application for small and medium business is to uh, employ the tools of behavior science we briefly talked about Robert Cialdini. Uh, he has uh, initially six, and now after 30 years, he added a seventh one last year, Principles of Influence. Uh, and these are tools like reciprocity, which is one that you mentioned. If you do something, if I do something for you uh, without any expectation of return, you're more likely to do something for me, uh, and often something much uh, larger in scale. Um, social proof, when you see other people doing something, you're more likely to do that thing yourself. Uh, and by understanding these kinds of tools, and there are lots of them out there, there uh, uh, Cialdini is one, he uh, is pretty much the uh, founder of the field of the science of influence or science of persuasion, but uh, uh, there are dozens and dozens of cognitive biases, things that uh, 
uh, were discovered by people like Daniel Kahneman and uh, his partner Tversky. Uh, the, uh, and these are things like uh, our loss aversion that uh, if you express something as a loss to your customer, it's going to seem more powerful than expressing that same thing as a gain. Uh, and there are dozens and dozens of these cognitive biases, some more powerful than, uh, than others. Uh, and one of Kahneman's key insights, too, is that we have two kinds of thinking, system one and system two. Uh, and when we think about uh, thinking, so I'm going to think about a problem, we're, we're actually um, have in mind system two, which is that sort of rational, logical, grind through it type thinking. Uh, but in fact, uh, our customers spend almost all their time in system one thinking, which is quick, uh, it's intuitive, it's emotional, it's rule-based. Uh, I did that yesterday at work, so I can do it again today without thinking. Uh, and uh, all of those uh, uh, decisions that we make uh, on a daily basis or even on one-off decisions to buy something are often made in system one. And then later on, if we have to justify, like, why did you buy that particular convertible car? Uh, then we go into system two to explain that it gets good gas mileage or that it's got a great resale value. And so to me, a uh, small, medium business can uh, use uh, these kinds of tools. And uh, typically, those are the sorts of things that I describe in my book, Brainfluence. Um, uh, and there's really no direct cost associated with these tools because what you're doing is you're changing the copy in your ads, you're changing uh, the headline, uh, you're changing the imagery. Uh, and uh, you're not necessarily buying more ads or new ads or more expensive ads. So I'm really curious how you got interested in this uh, in this area. Tell me a little bit about yourself, your history, and tell us your journey about how you landed here. Uh, well, it's kind of a strange thing. The uh, uh, I was thinking vaguely about the intersection of neuroscience and marketing uh, back in I uh, probably uh, 2003 2004, uh, and uh, at that point uh, I was. Um, a web marketing guy, still am to a small degree, but uh, uh, I did what uh, any good web marketer would do. I went out and registered a domain, neurosciencemarketing.com. Uh, and I didn't really have a specific plan for it. I just thought, okay, well, this would be something uh, good to have uh, as this uh, field come, becomes a little bit more prominent. And then about a year later, uh, again, more is an uh, uh, SEO thing than anything else. I started uh, writing there because I wanted to get some content out there because in those days, uh, the age of a website was important so that an older content was valued more. Uh, you can debate with your SEO friends today how true that is, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I thought that, okay, I'll put some uh, content out there. Uh, and as I wrote about it, I found it more and more intriguing and I put more and more effort into writing and as people uh, interacted with me, they commented or they emailed me, uh, that kind of guided me uh, in the direction. So initially, I started off talking about, as I said, these sort of uh, very traditional hard neuroscience tools uh, for neuromarketing. Uh, but my audience pulled me in the direction of the uh, more accessible and affordable kind of neuromarketing using behavior science. That's fascinating. So I think uh, we have this question, and I think it's part of our discussion guide, but I thought I would ask, which is, and Charles is asking it now too, which is how is neuromarketing different from traditional marketing? Uh, well, it's an enhancement, I would say. Uh, it's another tool to understand uh, how your customers make decisions, why they make decisions, uh, what they really like, and so on. Uh, it uh, is an extension of what might be called uh, you know, traditional market research using focus groups and surveys. And there's nothing wrong with uh, actually asking people questions. Uh, sometimes you can actually get reasonable answers. If you want to know uh, if uh, your customer uh, ate breakfast this morning, uh, you can probably ask that and get an, an answer that's accurate and truthful. But uh, if you start questioning them, uh, say, about uh, uh, their uh, alcohol consumption, uh, you're more likely to get uh, some inaccurate answers. Uh, if you uh, ask them about whether they will buy something, uh, a hypothetical product, uh, if it were available, uh, that answer may be very close to meaningless because there's so many different things there. They haven't seen the product. They don't really know what it's like. Uh, they're projecting their future behavior in this, uh, with this hypothetical, uh, and those answers tend to be very inaccurate. 
Uh, and so the, where neuro, neuromarketing helps is sort of getting below the surface to understand what those drivers are, uh, what does the customer really want, what will help them make the decision, uh, and so on. And uh, there are practitioners who uh, use uh, multiple neuromarketing uh, research techniques, uh, and they find that each technique adds a little bit of value to the accuracy of prediction. So if you uh, do EEG uh, and then uh, add to that some other um, uh, tools like implicit testing or facial coding, uh, each um, type of test adds a little bit of validity to the prediction, as does uh, simply asking people via surveys. So it seems like, and you know, forgive me if, let's see if I got this right, right? It almost seems like neuromarketing is almost like an evolution of traditional marketing because even inside of traditional marketing, whether we're doing A-B testing, whether we're doing focus groups or surveys, isn't that what we're just trying to do? We're trying somehow to get beneath the surface, but sometimes our respondents can trick us. Right. Well, I think savvy marketers have been working to get uh, below the surface for decades. If you go back to some of the great ad campaigns of the past, uh, they incorporated uh, emotional elements and they really accurately gauged what would move consumers. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, most marketers, even today, fall into that trap of uh, wanting to talk about their products, the product features, its specifications, its, its benefits, and so on. And there's nothing wrong with features and benefits, but often that isn't what really drives the customer, but it's what marketers uh, really tend to like to talk about, particularly if they have uh, invested a lot of their own uh, effort and capital into coming up with those products. Uh, they know how good they are and they want to explain how good those products are. And unfortunately, uh, they're not necessarily addressing the customer's hot buttons, which could be a particular pain point. Uh, it could be the fact that this product is really more of an emotional decision uh, rather than a uh, uh, very logical, rational decision. I think automobiles are a great example of that. You know, if uh, and automobile marketers actually do often employ sort of various types of emotional marketing techniques. But if you ask somebody what they're looking for in a car, they're going to go down this list of uh, gas mileage and resale value and affordability and you know all of the, the sorts of things that you would talk about uh, with a car salesman. Uh, but if you look at why people really buy cars, often, I mean, there's certainly a few people who buy them simply for transportation because that's all they can afford. But um, more often, for people with uh, budgets to choose from different types of models and brands and so on, uh, it's driven by prestige in some cases, a desire for prestige. So you see people buying a Mercedes or a Lexus, uh, not so much because those cars are uh, three times as good as uh, the models that they're three times ex as expensive as, uh, but rather because uh, they also uh, signal something about the person who buys them. Uh, as does, say, buying a hybrid like a Prius. Uh, often, I would say, a Prius owner is not necessarily going to get uh, uh, his or her money back from the premium that they paid, but uh, they are signaling to others something about them. Uh, other people may buy sports cars uh, because they think it'll make them look a little bit more attractive to members of the opposite sex. Uh, there are all kinds of drivers of uh, car buying behavior, uh, but most of them are not those rational considerations that people like to talk about. Oh, that's, you know, so the next question I wanted to ask you, first of all, I want to tell you that you have a big fan that just dropped in. Stacy DiPolo is here. So excited. She like saw this thing. It was like, I'm coming in. So it's really <laughs> great. great. Well, hi, Stacey. Here. She's a big fan. Um, so I wanted to ask you, one of the questions we have is, is neuromarketing manipulative? Because, you know, we're really trying to dig down into those inner emotions and it wouldn't be, you know, too far to say that it could be manipulative. What do you think? Well, I think that any kind of sales or marketing technique can be manipulative. Uh, uh, and I, my go-to answer to that is, uh, it actually comes from the greatest salesperson of all time, Zig Ziglar. Uh, and uh, he said that uh, the most important persuasion tool that you have uh, is your own integrity. And by that, I think what he meant was that if you are helping your customer get to a better place uh, and then use a particular closing technique, he wrote an entire book about, I don't know, 20 different closing techniques. 
Uh, and certainly those can sound manipulative, you know, the presumptive close where uh, would you like this delivered on Tuesday or Wednesday? Uh, you know, this type of thing could be uh, seen as manipulative, but if he was simply helping uh, customers having difficulty making the decision, uh, make that decision so that then uh, they could have the product that they really needed or wanted, uh, then he didn't consider that man manipulative. And so I think I would apply the same standard to uh, marketers, whether they're using neuromarketing or whether they're doing uh, just any non-neuro type of marketing or advertising. Uh, if you are helping uh, your customer get to a better place, uh, then using the tools of persuasion that are available to you uh, makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, if your ads contain deceptive information or they omit important information that might influence the customer's decision, uh, then uh, you are being manipulative and that's not a good thing. Yeah, I gotcha. And you know, and I think these days, and actually that leads into our next question, which we were talking about, is neuromarketing there to, I've heard people say it's there to disrupt, or influence or persuade? What do you think about that? Um, I don't know. Um, I think it's, uh, depending on the kind of neuromarketing that you're talking about, it may be just a tool to understand better uh, what the customer wants, what their hot buttons are, or it may be used as a tool to persuade, as in if we are, say, employing some of the uh, uh, the common things that we do as marketers, like using social proof that, hey, subscribe to my blog. I've got 57,000 subscribers already. Uh, that gives that new potential subscriber a feeling, oh, okay, hey, this, this is a popular thing. Other people are finding value in it. Uh, and uh, so that would be a tool of persuasion. Uh, but uh, you know, to me, the key thing about neuromarketing is that um, according to uh, scientists and the one that I definition that I use comes from Gerald Zaltman of Harvard is and that is that 95% of our thought processes and decision-making processes are non-conscious only 5% are conscious so uh, if we have tools that can first of all help us understand what's going on in that 95% of our customers brain uh, and then uh, gear our marketing toward that 95% uh, that is the key function of neuromarketing. Yeah, that's that's such a great point. So how could a small business then use neuromarketing to attract new customers? Because it's almost like a disruption. See, that's how I see it. I'm sort of thinking like the disruption is like if you if they trigger something emotionally new, whether it's a smell or a texture or whatever, something that you may not have considered that you're like, ooh, look like squirrel, <laughs> right? Right. Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, as I said, small business can use uh, neuromarketing uh, to get new customers by, uh, un well, first of all, understanding, even if they understand their current customers very well, it may help them understand those customers who aren't buying from them right now and perhaps access new customer groups. Uh, but I think more importantly, uh, if you look at most marketing, uh, it's extremely ineffective. Uh, you know, websites have a, you know, 60, 70% bounce rate, uh, maybe only a uh, two or 3% conversion rate. Uh, emails uh, convert at uh, only about 2%. Uh, and, you know, you can, uh, only 5% of new products are successful. And you can go down the list and you look at all the marketing money that's wasted. And so yeah. if a small business or actually a business of any size uh, can use some of these tools to, uh, uh, be a little bit more effective and appealing, uh, uh, that's going to reduce the amount of wasted marketing and it's going to bring many more new customers into the fold. Imagine if uh, your uh, cold emails uh, were 4% instead of 2% effective, uh, you know, that's, uh, it seems like a small percentage increase, but that would be twice the number of new customers. So, Okay, so I have this question that's been bouncing around, and if you're, I don't know, what should I say, practicing neuromarketing, does that imply that you are using some type of technology? You know what I'm saying? Is is neuromarketing purely related to tools like fMRI and EEG, or are there some like low-tech, no-tech ways to right. use well, yes, and uh, with my definition uh, definition of neuromarketing, uh, since I bring in uh, basically um, uh, persuasion psychology, behavior science, social science, and so on, 
uh, into the broader definition of neuromarketing, uh, then yes, these are tools that can be used by anybody. Uh, in my book, Brainfluence, uh, I deliberately broke it into 100 very short chapters, uh, each of which was built around uh, a scientific principle or study of some kind, but then showing how uh, that could be applied in real-world marketing. Uh, and um, perhaps not all of those, but I would say the vast majority of those uh, 100 techniques uh, can be used by businesses of any size. It may be merely the way a price is expressed, uh, the way a headline reads, uh, use of the right adjectives. Like, in, in fact, one of the sort of uh, uh, principles of copywriting is don't use adjectives. They slow the reader down. They uh, simply get in the way of your action words like verbs and nouns. Uh, and in certain ways, that's true. But uh, some research by Brian Wansink, uh, who at Cornell, i uh, done a lot of research in both uh, the uh, eating space, restaurant space, and in many uh, in broader areas, found that the right adjectives uh, could increase sales. Uh, and he did a, an experiment with restaurant menus where they uh, added uh, words uh, to a menu that instead of describing uh, something as uh, eggs, they would say freshly cracked eggs or uh, uh, instead of barbecue sauce, it was Jack Daniel's barbecue sauce. And what they found were that uh, these kinds of adjectives had a very significant impact on results. And uh, they broke down into several categories. Uh, they, they could be vivid or sensory. So if they somehow ignited the customer's senses, uh, that worked. So the freshly cracked uh, eggs, I mean, all eggs are freshly cracked, right? If you're making eggs, you don't have them you know, sitting around on a, uh, I don't know what, what you'd have if it wasn't encased in its shell. Uh, uh, things like the brands, uh, nostalgic uh, words like uh, instead of uh, cookies, uh, you know, grandma's oatmeal cookies, uh, all of these kinds of things could actually increase sales. And these adjectives cost absolutely nothing to add to your copy. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, so basically, I guess we can say that uh, if you're looking at doing some, you know, adding neuromarketing to your small business strategy, it doesn't have to involve a lot of technology. You can use simple things like just testing copy, right? And bringing these adjectives in to your descriptions. Right. Oh, absolutely. And, and one thing too, if um, a business is an e-commerce business or if they get much of their business over the web, there are such great tools uh, to use for A-B testing and uh, uh, you know, very simple, uh, often free or cheap tools uh, that you, know, you should never just say, hey, uh, I heard Roger say that uh, uh, you should add a descriptive adjective to increase right. sales and then add a bunch of descriptive adjectives and just assume that that's going to be effective. It's far better to do that in the form of an A-B test where you start with whatever you have currently uh, add something or change something and see if that works uh, and then perhaps try some variations on uh, that and uh, work from that knowledge base. You know, if you are uh, doing primarily in-person sales or uh, some other, uh, you know, print, uh, print is you can do testing, but it's a little bit more difficult and expensive, certainly not as flexible. Uh, uh, you know, that sort of testing is tougher, but if you are uh, using digital tools, web apps or uh, websites, then uh, do that testing both to you know, ensure that the things you're changing are actually working and guide you uh, as to how you can continue to keep improving. So, uh, and not just A-B testing, but there are tools that uh, let you uh, evaluate where people look, uh, uh, where people are clicking, uh, where their mouse is moving around on the page and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, even just scroll depth, for example, how far are people getting down the page? If you combine some of these very simple, inexpensive uh, analytics tools uh, with neuromarketing, you'll end up getting uh, much better results because often, uh, you know, you might, for example, uh, you might put some really important images or copy changes in your uh, product description, but when you look at the scroll depth, you find that people are leaving the page before they even get to those changes, uh, in right. which case you need to do something a little bit differently. 
I love uh, one of our uh, chat attendees, Randy Theo, who goes by at Idea Bloke says, maybe it's just me, but neuromarketing is like NLP, which carries with it shades of brainwashing. Woo! What do you say to that? Well, you know, first of all, people, I don't really draw that uh, direct conclusion, the NLP, but certainly people have um, um, made that linkage. And again, I think it really comes down to uh, your uh, intent. Uh, if you uh, are trying to uh, go for a quick one-off sale, a dis and you don't care about dissatisfied customers, uh, then uh, certainly uh, you know, some of these techniques could be used in a manipulative way. But uh, just about every business I know, even you know, whether they're small business or big business, uh, does not make their money on that first sale. Uh, they make them uh, make their money from repeat customers uh, that recommend them to their friends and generate business that way. So uh, there are very few business models, I think, that can support uh, manipulative selling. You know, there, there are probably some out there, uh, but uh, generally uh, they tend to be, those businesses tend to be very short-lived and uh, not something that most entrepreneurs would want to be involved with. I love that. I'm writing that down so that everyone can see. So let's talk a little bit about first impressions because they are so powerful. Um, what role does neuromarketing play in the uh, creation of first impressions? Well, uh, not just in the creation, but the understanding of first impressions, because some of the work uh, that was done uh, really surprised um, uh, scientists who did it uh, using uh, various neuroscience tools. Uh, they found that, first of all, people were uh, processing uh, things uh, like imagery and websites in milliseconds, uh, where uh, before people could actually, have, uh, say, read your headline, looked at the image and understood what that image was, uh, much less read any copy, they had formed a first impression of your website. And uh, in fact, sometimes as little as 50 milliseconds of exposure to something can create an impression, some, even an unconscious uh, impression. So uh, subliminal uh, uh, imagery can have an influence. Uh, it's not generally used by ethical marketers, uh, but you can create a, uh, an impression uh, that sort of flies under the conscious radar of the consumer. But um, some of the other science about first impressions is uh, that there will, we, we know they're formed very quickly, uh, often unconsciously before we've had a chance to read anything or study anything. Uh, but also these first impressions are very long lasting. Uh, they're hard to lose. Even uh, what some experiments have presented people with factual information that's counter to their first impression. Uh, and what they found was that uh, the first impressions were very sticky. It took a lot of information to change them. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things uh, that I remember we studied in the world of marketing, um, which was what, how did it go? Behaviors are the easiest to change. Then you go to like attitudes, something, and then like beliefs and values. So like there's this, this like descending uh, layers that you can influence. Right, and um, you know, in general, uh, marketers aren't trying to get down to those uh, deeper levels, but it might, it's kind of disconcerting to think that somebody could open up your website uh, uh, and before they read anything, uh, have a pretty good feeling that they uh, think you're uh, reliable and ethical, or maybe you're a little bit sketchy. Uh, and yeah. that's all based on this uh, very quick non-conscious processing of uh, what they're seeing. And, and so uh, that's, that's kind of the scary part, I think. And that's why uh, you know, having uh, uh, a good design doesn't have to be a, a really costly design, but ensuring that uh, your design is pleasing at a glance and professional looking uh, is so important. I mean, a lot of people have the feeling that, well, I'm not here you know, to look fancy. I'm here to communicate an important message. The problem is uh, nobody will listen to or believe your important message uh, if you haven't convinced them initially that you're worth listening to. 
Exactly. And I think that's it's fascinating. I had an experience over the last week. I was at a conference, and one of the things that people consistently say to me, and I'm like, yay, not that I did any neuromarketing big-time research or anything, but people are like, oh, my God, you, like, seeing your website and then meeting you, it feels like completely the same experience or vice versa. So, you know, all of the brands should be working towards because you cannot be somebody else. Right. Well, these days, consumers, I think, enforce that uh, on brands. Uh, you know, there, there was a time when you could sort of build a false image. Uh, but uh, these days, as we know, uh, whenever there is a dissonance between reality and that false image, uh, it will uh, get uh, found out and promoted. And if there's a big dissonance, as we've seen uh, most recently with United Airlines, uh, oh my it gosh, goes viral right? and uh, really... Uh, damages the brand tremendously. Exactly. I mean, in that, I, that that's something that I've always been an advocate for because I'm like, especially in today's world of social media, and all, it, you don't even have to be filming yourself. You can believe that somebody is grabbing a snapshot of you doing whatever. You right. know, very, very true. And uh, you know, most uh, companies aren't going to have the kind of experience that United Airlines did, but nevertheless, uh, if they have uh, even a few employees who interact with customers, you know, one employee who's having a bad day uh, and gives a rude answer to a customer or something that uh, says something that's inappropriate, uh, you know, in the past, that wouldn't even be noticed. Uh, you know, that one customer might be a little bit miffed, but uh, uh, nobody would know about it. Now, you know, that customer might have 30,000 Twitter followers and or might uh, post it on their Facebook page in some uh, or in a local uh, neighborhood group of some kind. So the, uh, you know, the old line about uh, if you have an unhappy customer, they tell 10 other people. I don't know yeah. what that multiplier is today, but it's a lot, <laughs> lot bigger. Yeah, exactly. It is certainly not easy. Um, so let's jump over into data, right? There's, there's a lot of talk about neuromarketing and data. And I think you will just laugh as I'm looking through the Twitter stream. Folks are so excited about this topic, but they're complaining. Do you know what the big complaint is? Not enough characters in Twitter to yes. talk about neuromarketing, such a big topic. But um, let's talk about data and what role data plays and maybe what kinds of data can small business owners access that, that they can use that's easy. You talked a little bit about um, eye tracking and click tracking and so on and so forth. What other kinds of data could small business owners use to help their neuromarketing efforts? Well, I think there's um, the, the, the real challenge, I think, is sorting through all the data that's potentially available and finding those things that are, that are going to be most meaningful uh, for your own situation. Uh, but I think uh, that the data thing flows two ways with neuromarketing. First of all, uh, data that's collected by, uh, uh, say, on websites, by analytics programs like Google Analytics or uh, other tools that may combine uh, that data with uh, outside data or third-party data, uh, that is giving you information about how your customers behave in the real world. Uh, and again, that's something I started off my marketing career in uh, direct marketing. Uh, I co-founded a catalog business, and this was before the internet. And so we mailed paper catalogs to people, and they uh, either bought, uh, phoned in, or mailed in orders to us. Uh, it was a great business, but we really had uh, no information as to how our customers consume that catalog. You know, did they look at the cover and toss it in the trash? Did they? Uh, look through a few pages. Do they start from the front? Do they start from the back? Do they randomly open a page in the middle? Uh, you know, how long do they stay on an individual page? We have none of that information. Uh, these days, uh, on websites and apps, you have all of that information and a lot more. Uh, so uh, you can uh, find out how your customers are really behaving in the real world. And that's one of the goals of neuromarketing is to uh, determine what people are really doing and really thinking uh, rather than what they say they uh, are doing or thinking. So that's that's one uh, one direction that it flows. And then the other direction, I think, uh, and there, I don't think there's been a ton of this done yet, but it's, it's certainly under a lot of discussion, uh, and that is uh, bringing uh, 
neuromarketing data, uh, for instance, uh, uh, personality data, psych uh, psychological profile data, uh, bringing that uh, in uh, and combining it with uh, user data, behavior data, uh, so that then uh, you could perhaps say individualize your marketing uh, to an even greater degree that's already being done. And obviously, folks like Amazon are doing that already. They're showing you things that they think you might like and uh, so on. So they're, uh, they're, they're pretty far down that learning curve. Uh, but we've also seen that uh, Facebook has attempted to uh, both assess personalities uh, and perhaps even gear ads to people who are experiencing a certain emotion. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, it's, it's a really interesting area. It's, it's hard to see how this is going to evolve uh, and whether there will be some restrictions at some point because, uh, uh, you know, if uh, you could uh, identify somebody who is uh, borderline clinically depressed, would it be appropriate to, uh, you know, advertise uh, uh, a box of chocolates to them or something? You know, it, uh, hard to say. It might, it might have good, uh, a good conversion rate, but it uh, uh, was certainly questionable in terms of ethics. Ah, you have fans here. Jason Schemmel, he's a friend of mine. He's, uh, he works over in uh, publishing, and he said he's read your book, and he absolutely loves it. And I think you're right. I think that at some point, with access to data being so prevalent, that perhaps, or let me ask you, do you think that the world of traditional marketing and neuromarketing is somehow going to collapse on itself and like everything will be neuromarketing? Because it sure sounds that way. Yeah, I mean, to a degree, I think you're right. As some of these tools become more commonplace, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, uh, for uh, years, uh, neuromarketing studies were basically done by big brands for big ad expenses, uh, where you were uh, uh, wanted to evaluate, say, a Super Bowl ad or a big ad campaign that was going to run on national TV for a month or something like that. Uh, but uh, most recently, uh, I've seen some neuromarketing companies saying, hey, uh, if you're thinking about putting two images in your next ad, we can tell you which one will produce the emotional response uh, that you want in your consumer. So it's getting down to the point where, uh, you know, instead of just saying, you know, telling your um, uh, graphic artist, hey, will you, do you like uh, this image or that image? Uh, you might run a, uh, you know, a $200 test uh, to see which one works better. And as you know, it's, so it's going to keep pushing down into being uh, much more of a mainstream activity that's accessed frequently for all kinds of ads, not just really expensive campaigns. Exactly. And I think one of the other things that you could really look at, and I think you alluded to it a little bit in terms of, let's say, Facebook ads, like if somebody is depressed, that it kind of reminds me of the way Target was using data to be able to tell that a woman was pregnant before she knew she was pregnant because they were able to just like look at all of these things, right? Right, and neither needless to say, this creep people out. Uh, you know, they totally. don't uh, don't really want their uh, the people who are selling them stuff to know that much about them and to use it in a way that could be potentially embarrassing uh, to them. Uh, so. I think uh, most marketers are being a little bit more subtle about it. Uh, like a target learned. Uh, not to send uh, these people that identif they identified as being probably pregnant uh, uh, <laughs> specific flyers about uh, pregnancy products, but rather to uh, send them flyers that interspersed uh, a number of these products with other uh, non-related products. So it didn't appear that these people were being individually targeted. Uh, and that's probably a wise move. Uh, but I mean, it's, it also shows the extent to which uh, data can be used. And this, this is not new. That, that happened a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so it's only getting uh, better and more invasive. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, and I would have to imagine that we are the ones that are driving that data with the level of open uh, volunteer, uh, what's it, voluntary sharing that we do about things. Right. If you're mm -hmm. if you're posting pictures on Facebook or Twitter or wherever or Instagram that you are traveling somewhere, you shouldn't be surprised if you get promotional uh, things from wherever you're traveling to. Right. Well, it's this trade off that I think people have been willing to make because they get a lot of value from Facebook. Uh, you know, people spend some people spend hours uh, on it uh, and they uh, enjoy it. They interact with the friends. They make new friends. They keep in touch. Uh, you know, so it's it's a, and like Google, for instance, uh, 
Uh, you know, could we live without Google and searches? You know, probably not. Uh, it'd be extremely difficult to go back to that world when we couldn't just get any piece of information that we wanted, but with uh, you know a few keystrokes. But uh, we've created a sort of uh, Faustian bargain where we're saying, okay, we're going to give you access to our innermost thoughts, and basically. Uh, you can do whatever you want with those because there's not really much in the way of legal protection or anything else. Uh, so, uh, you know, eventually uh, something will probably happen here that uh, rules will be defined. But at the moment, uh, it's, uh, you know, that's pretty much the bargain that's been created. And it, it seems to work for most people. Most people uh, do not feel that they have uh, suffered because Google has their info or Facebook has their info. But Oh, uh, hey, you know, Mark Zuckerberg uh, apparently has thought about running for president. Uh, oh, uh, my would you goodness. like to put all of that, uh, uh, that knowledge and power uh, in the hands of a presidential candidate? Ugh. But I have a question from the audience, Roger. Stacy wants to know, how can a brand benefit from neuromarketing or any marketing and earn your trust and let customer needs drive? I think what she's saying is, you know, how can a brand benefit from neuromarketing and also maintain that customer trust that they want that's so valuable? Oh, well, first of all, most brands don't talk much about their neuromarketing. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, very few go public with that kind of uh, information, if you have. Uh, and I think that the way to do that, uh, if uh, necessary, is to, uh, or if, if they want to, is to couch it in terms of creating a better product. Uh, you know, I think that people would accept uh, using many tools if it results in a better product. If it results in more manipulative advertising, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, and I think that the, uh, uh, the way uh, to do it, I think Amazon provides a good example where they obviously use a lot of information that they know about me, whether it's neuromarketing or uh, otherwise, uh, to offer me products and to design their web pages and so on. But uh, at least personally, uh, I would say Amazon is the most trusted brand I deal with. Uh, and I occasionally pay a premium to deal with them simply because uh, I trust them and they're so reliable. So uh, clearly they're using their knowledge of me uh, to sell me stuff. But uh, I don't find that to be a negative. I find it to be a positive. So I, th I think it's all in the way that the company implements it. Mm, that is a great answer. I've got it down in there. Let's see if that's good for Stacy. Stacy, if you're listening, let us know if we answered your question. So I am really, really curious about pricing. And this has come up. Uh, in a few discussions and customers are, are my readers and everyone's always asking me how do you set prices and you know that that whole conversation this is where uh, Dan Ayerly's work is so powerful whether it's whether you should end your price in a seven or a nine when to have a round figure when not to have a round figure when to position the price by having it be contrastedly high and so on and so forth enlighten us Right. Well, there are um, probably uh, dozens of different psychological pricing techniques, uh, and uh, Dan Ariely talked about some of them. Uh, and the first thing I would say is before anybody goes off and says, okay, this is how I'm going to change all my prices now and uh, because I'm going to sell more stuff, uh, testing, as usual, is always important. Uh, just because uh, a price ending in 97 worked for Sears for 20 years, uh, it does not mean it'll work for you today. Uh, and, uh, you know, rules that work in one industry or one situation uh, may not work that well in others. Uh, fancy restaurants often uh, omit currency symbols and decimals and zeros uh, from their prices. So an entree might simply be noted with a very small 3.9 for $39. Uh, right. Uh, you know, and uh, that tends to work in that industry, and there's some good psychology behind that. Uh, in general, currency symbols uh, cause people to become a little bit more selfish and self-oriented, which might uh, help or hurt you in a particular situation. Say more and, about that, the use of currency symbols. Yes. Uh, in fact, there's some interesting study, and I don't know if any of our uh, participants today are uh, nonprofits, 
but uh, it's particularly important for anybody who is making an altruistic appeal for uh, volunteers for donations or whatever. Uh, currency sim exposure to currency symbols, like say uh, uh, a picture of uh, money, a picture of coins, uh, maybe a, a dollar symbol or a euro symbol. Uh, these cause people to behave in a different way. Uh, and scientists investigated this by uh, putting somebody in a room where they were just waiting for an experiment to take place. And they just said, you know, just wait in this room here. And they were uh, very subtly exposed either to currency symbols uh, or a neutral image, like a, say uh, on a screensaver, there might be fish or something. That, and what they found was uh, that the uh, people who were exposed to the currency symbols behaved uh, in a more self-oriented, less generous fashion when they finally went into the next room and proceeded with an experiment uh, that uh, had them say, uh, give them, gave them the opportunity to help somebody else or not help somebody. Uh, they were uh, much more likely to help that person if they had not been exposed to the currency symbols. Uh, even They even sat farther apart from each other uh, if they had been exposed to currency symbols. So, uh, I mean, it's a very subtle effect, but uh, the other, um, I think, um, uh, fairly reliable piece of uh, uh, pricing advice uh, is that people tend to value precise prices more. They, they believe them more. Uh, and there's a bunch of experiments, uh, and it, they relate for everything from a, say, a $50 product uh, up to a $500,000 house uh, that uh, scientists will uh, show people a picture of a product uh, and uh, a price and say, well, what do you think this is really worth? And typically what they'll do is uh, show them, say, a, a television, and uh, a third of the people will see a price of $500 even, a third will see $498.52, uh, and the other third will see uh, $501.23. Uh, and what they typically find uh, when they run that kind of test is that the even price uh, is marked way down. So in that case, people might say, well, that $500 TV is really worth maybe, you know, $420. Uh, but when they see the uh, precise price, whether it's a little bit higher or a little bit lower, uh, they'll say, yeah, it's probably worth like $485. So a much uh, smaller devaluation. Uh, so in general, uh, precise pricing is going to be more effective uh, in almost any, uh, any marketplace. Uh, again, it's always worth a test if you're selling a $5 item or something, maybe uh, just that really simple five will work better, but uh, people will uh, tend to assign uh, a sort of more credible value to a precise price. I love what Steve King says. Uh, apparently, they studied neuromarketing, and he said uh, consumers, we studied how consumers view neuro neuromarketing, and simply put, they don't like it. I think that speaks to your point about why brands are sort of keeping it keeping it hushed, right? Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's neuromarketing hushed. sounds really scary because it sounds like mind control. Uh, you show somebody a picture of uh, a neuromarketing subject, somebody who's uh, being evaluated with, say, like a full EEG cap on, uh, and it looks like something uh, out of a science fiction movie or maybe a horror movie, and you think that, wow, uh, they're probably injecting thoughts into this person's brain or something. Uh, and in fact, it's, uh, you know, it, that's not the case. But uh, nevertheless, the, the, just the concept uh, is kind of scary. I think if you were able to phrase uh, a question to a consumer in a way, uh, you know, do you like all the ads you see on TV? You know, what if we had a way of eliminating 50% uh, of the ads that you find really uh, boring or annoying? Uh, they'd say, well, that'd be great. Uh, and that's really what uh, neuromarketing studies do. Uh, they don't enable the brands to make these super powerful ads that persuade people to buy stuff they don't need. Uh, but I think what the, uh, for evaluating advertising, uh, the real promise of neuromarketing is to eliminate the probably uh, at least 60% or more of ads that really don't move the needle at all for the brand and are potentially annoying to the consumer. Well, ads are all annoying to the consumer. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if basically you've got uh, ads that do nothing for the brand and annoy the customer, uh, that's serving nobody well. And if you could uh, do something that would make uh, the ads uh, 
engaging to the consumer where they wouldn't mind watching them, uh, then uh, you know that would be a huge, uh, a huge impact. Or even just get rid of the worst ones that you know yeah. people hate. I know they're really evolving. But I'm, I've got a question from Stacy. Stacy wants to know if you know any cool software tools to quickly determine which copy or images stimulate which emotions when people are deciding. Uh, quick answer. Quick, yeah, yeah, quick answer. Yeah, uh, quick answer to that is uh, no. I don't know of uh, any cool software tools that would do that. I um, although if anybody listening has an idea, then uh, that certainly uh, they could jump in. Uh, but I think we're not quite at the point when where there are simple tools to do that. Uh, I think what we will see are uh, some very simple, uh, uh, say, implicit testing or time testing tools uh, that can. I'll let uh, people say, uh, uh, let a company evaluate a couple of images very quickly. Uh, so, I mean, that's, uh, it's not quite at uh, the do-it-yourself level yet, but uh, it's probably evolving in that direction. Uh, and yep. also facial coding too. It, it's not yet at the do-it-yourself level yet, but uh, eventually you probably will be able to buy some simple tools that would let you uh, do some sort of facial coding testing to gauge that emotional expression. Then you could show them uh, the uh, headlines or the images or whatever, uh, and you can make a decision. Yeah, I sort of defaulted. I I I, I threw back uh, the the couple tools I'm familiar with, not even close, but that you could possibly use are Crazy Egg, and I think it's AppSumo. They have that tracking software, so you can kind of see where people's mouse goes, as you said earlier. Um, you could also simply do some basic A/B testing with any of your pages, there's apps to do that by adjusting the headline or the images. I actually had a friend who, um, actually he was a guest on the show a while back, his name is Mike Michalowicz, and he wrote the book Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. Oh, and, no, he's a friend of mine. Oh yeah, isn't he awesome? Well, here's a really fun test that he did. Uh, he, <clears throat> at the time, his website was very similar to mine. It was just an image of him holding a book, I think, holding one of his books. And he said, that he had one picture where he was wearing a wedding band and another picture where he was not wearing a wedding band. And clearly there was something, people noticed that because the picture with the wedding band did much better. Yeah, I, uh, I heard that same story from Mike and that, I found that interesting because uh, uh, it seems like such a subtle element that most people wouldn't even process it, although uh, there's definitely science showing that we process more than we're consciously aware of. Yes. Uh, the, so um, uh, the other thing I'd be interested to know, uh, I did not ask him at the time uh, how large of a test that was and whether that really held up over time because uh, for, let me say two things about A-B testing. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to be wary of your initial results. Uh, mm. You know, you've uh, got the headline that you've had on your web page for the last uh, uh, two years and you've got a new headline. You, you start A-B testing the new headline. Whoa, that one's converting 30% better. Uh, what uh, you want to do is be sure you give that enough time to run uh, because almost uh, every conversion expert will tell you that when you see that kind of result, uh, there's often sort of a convergence to the mean where uh, that'll uh, tend to moderate over time. Or you can yeah. even be misled just by sort of a, a wild result that goes away quickly uh, with more data. But uh, uh, the, the other thing I'll say about A-B testing is that uh, it potentially short circuits the uh, neuromarketing uh, piece because uh, if if you were doing a neuromarketing study of some kind, whether it's facial coding or EEG or implicit testing, you're trying to get at, uh, gee, uh, okay, can we get the right emotion in our consumer so they'll buy our product? Uh, if you can use A-B testing, uh, you don't have to understand that as much uh, I mean, it's good to know that sort of information so you can plan future marketing, but you are measuring the actual customer behavior because you may think that, uh, wow, uh, I produced this uh, very uh, happy reaction with this image. But uh, then when you actually implement that, you find, well, yeah, the, the customers are happy, but they aren't buying the product. Uh, maybe I needed to make them angry, uh, which normally if you've got an anger reaction to your ad, uh, you know, that would be something, oh, let's change that graphic, change that headline. Uh, so with uh, A-B testing or other kinds of uh, actual uh, measurement of consumer behavior, uh, you don't have to 
make that leap from, well, okay, A, am I measuring the right emotion? Uh, B, if I am getting the emotion I think I want, is that really going to change the, produce the behavior that I want? Uh, if you can measure the actual behavior, you're far better off just doing that and uh, oh, you know, testing different things to optimize uh, the results. So my last question is always a future question, Roger. Where do you see the science going? How do you see it integrating, especially for small businesses? And finally, where can people get in touch with you? Okay, well, uh, I think uh, I've already alluded to the uh, sort of future direction of neuromarketing. And uh, the, uh, what, what I see is, first of all, greater academic respect. Uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, people would not talk about neuromarketing. And they might talk about decision science or some sort of related areas. But uh, neuromarketing was seen as sort of a hucksterish thing that uh, people were out there making wild claims about what they could measure with these tools uh, that uh, scientists really found uh, pretty uh, unbelievable. And, and some of those claims may have been pretty unbelievable. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, now we're seeing universities uh, actually doing neuromarketing studies and calling it either neuromarketing or consumer neuroscience. So that's the field is getting much more respect and attention. Uh, the second thing is that the costs are coming down and the scalability is going up. Uh, and that's going to really open the door to different kinds of neuromarketing testing for even smaller businesses. Uh, and this is something that just, you know, people want to stay on top of. It's not, uh, um, it's probably still most small businesses will be more in a uh, applying the findings of others than going out and running their own tests. But uh, going forward, uh, some of these tools will start opening up. And, and currently there are tools uh, that, you know, you mentioned and I mentioned that let uh, even a very small business evaluate what their customers are really doing. And, and that information is golden. I mean, it's, it's even better than making a leap from, uh, you know, gauging an emotional state and then uh, going from that to will they buy and, and so on. Exactly. Uh, and as far as how to uh, find me, uh, I am uh, most easily found at rogerdooley.com, uh, R-O-G-E-R-D-O-O-L-E-Y.com. Uh, and uh, there I've got jumping off points to uh, my books, my social profiles, and so on. Probably my uh, social uh, network of choice would be Twitter, where I am at Roger Dooley. And I've got blogs at Forbes and Entrepreneur, and uh, you can typically also just Google me for uh, uh, most of my major content areas. Yeah, we love some of your articles. It was really fantastic and really, really appreciate how generous you've been answering questions, being on Twitter. And there you have it, guys. Another Bizapalooza chat plugged in around your marketing today. Please join us. If you want to catch the replay, go to smallbizapalooza.com forward slash blog. You will see the replay there. If you've missed anything, tweet us questions, tweet us answers. Always happy to have you. And Roger, thank you for being here. Well, Ivana, thanks for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun.